Vertigo C is about an attempt to bring together a set of stories or narratives about terrible encounters with the sea. <laughs> um, and those encounters are united by the fact that they all involve people, either as victims or perpetrators. Um, so that's one thing I can say it's about. The other thing is, uh, for me, the piece was an attempt to think about our relationship to the sea, uh, and very specifically the sea as, um, as a, a sort of vessel for journeys. You know? um, and the reason why that was the case was uh, about three years ago, I was just sitting down listening to the radio and I heard a group of young Nigerians talking about trying to make that journey, which is now very, very famous everywhere in Europe, you know, that journey across the Mediterranean. And the way they talked about it, you know, started me thinking, uh, because the sense was uh, they had never thought that they would encounter something so overwhelming, <laughs> something so large and potentially uh, life threatening, you know. Um, and the description was about the, the terror of the sea, which had a certain kind of beauty to it as they described it, you know. Um, one of them in particular said that at one point he saw, he saw himself almost at the point of death and he started to say, Jesus save me, Jesus save me, which is the sort of opening mantra to the piece. And that opening mantra kept coming back to me again and again and again. Um, and slowly it started to dawn on me that the, the journey wasn't just a, a physical one, it was a kind of spiritual and emotional one, that, that the sea provides the platform for that kind of conversion. <laughs> the ethical reasons, their aesthetic and maybe quote-unquote political reasons for trying to make vertical, vertical sea, but there are ethical ones in, as well. And one of the ethical ones started for me when uh, one of the uh, politicians in Britain referred to these people who were trying to, to cross the Mediterranean as cockroaches. And I thought, wow. I mean, like, what happens in our mind that allows us to construct another human being who's really just trying to, to live? That's all they're trying to do. As a cockroach, a cockroach suggests uh, contagion, suggests um, a plague of diseases of all kinds. And you know, how do you how do you get to a position where you lose empathy so much, you know, that you refer to another human being? However desperate they might be to to enter your space as a cockroach, you know. And I realized that part of what we had to do ethically was to was to construct a kind of tapestry of empathy so that people firstly understood what the experience of this journey is um, and that that journey isn't it's not about trying to do us harm <laughs> first and foremost no, no one's doing this to hurt us <laughs> they are trying to survive you know um, and the second ethical reason it seemed to me uh, was that so much of our life is is characterized by amnesia. So everything feels like an emergency because we think it's the first time that it's happening, you know. And one of the things I wanted to do was to remind people that these moments have happened before, you know. Uh, so that I remember as a child in the 70s a similar 
kind of moral panic about the Vietnamese boat people, who for, again, very similar reasons, were just trying to find a place to live. Some of them were just trying to escape persecution, or you know, the usual litany of reasons why people want to get away. Um, and also in the case of the Vietnamese, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people died at sea in order to achieve this now. You think about it now, nobody remembers it anymore. These Vietnamese citizens are respectable members of societies across the world. They're fine. And the world's fine. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> uh, any more than anything will happen as a result of Syrians or Afghanis doing exactly the same thing. So it, was, uh, it felt ethically as if the important thing is to remind people of the need for empathy and the need to recognize historical parallels, you know, uh, to just simply say to them, look, this has happened before. It will probably continue to happen, possibly the other way around. Who knows? We might be the ones trying to get over the, as global warming becomes, you know, you don't know. But whatever the case, it's fine. You know, the world will survive and nothing cataclysmic will happen. <laughs> Anyone who watches um, Vertigo Sea will be struck immediately by the fact that it's a kind of um, union of um, different forms of images, different kinds of, you know, so you have uh, daguerreotypes from the 19th century, um, uh, material that I shot myself, um, uh, newsreel footage uh, from mainly the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and of course a lot of um, scenes of nature, most of which came on the understanding from BBC natural history, that I would use it responsibly, quote unquote. And I think I have. Um, because the, the attempt was to find a way of getting all of these strands to talk to each other, to, to converse, to have a conversation. Um, and in a way, the, the method of working on it is exactly how I hope people will both understand what we're talking about as well as appreciate the, the, the issues involved. These are, these are matters for democratic debate and understanding. The question of refugeeship is a matter of democratic debate. It's not one that's going to be solved by people saying, I don't want this, and therefore, it's, you know, we don't have the, the power <laughs> to say unilaterally, don't come. Uh, well, we can, but it, whether it makes any difference or not <laughs> is another question, because the emergency people are responding to is not ours. It's not ours, it's not our fear about the loss of our livelihood, it's the fear that they have for the loss of their life. Um, and so in, in a kind of metaphoric form, I wanted to find things which don't necessarily always talk together. <laughs> Images uh, that don't necessarily talk together and get them to, to talk, to converse and try and... Um, come up with solutions, <laughs> narrative solutions, you know. Um, we have discrete chapters and fragments and the relationship between the different components changes depending on which chapter or fragment you're in. But overall, uh, by the end of it, all of them would have come into some relation to each other. Both with images and, 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 and sounds. You know, I have very, very particular ideas about them. And those ideas are informed by being exposed to different kinds of uh, films, artworks over the years. You know, I mean, I grew up and was schooled in um, uh, a, a vision of the avant garde which said, Images have to have a certain kind of edginess, um, and at best, you don't have sound. <laughs> Silence is golden. 
Well, you know, I mean, there are lots and lots and lots of time-based works from the avant-garde like that, which I admire. Uh, but I dispute the attempt to uh, reify this into a kind of universal norm. You know, it's it's not. We have to we have to find different ways of accessing the uncanny and and the mysterious and 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 stories. You know, for want of a better word. So. I've tried to come up with my own solutions um, and, and sound in particular, I'm not interested in the dichotomy of sound and silence. What I'm interested in principally is noise. Um, so in the pieces, words, music, uh, effects, are not, they're not important in themselves. They're just registers of noise. Um, and, and I see them almost as just literally wave forms <laughs> uh, in which the desire is to construct different kinds of intensities, different layers of chaos and harmony, etc., etc., etc. Those are the things I'm interested in. Um, uh, partly because, you know, I don't see the point in repeating something that someone you respect had done before. You know, um, we spend so much time in the avant-garde and in filmmaking, worshiping silence. You know, the Tarkovsky silence or the Bressonian silence or the Brackage silence. I mean, you know, I mean, these guys. They've done it. <laughs> There's no need to do, keep doing it. <laughs> they have done it. So let's move on. <laughs> let's find other ways of of, um, of accessing the the sonic. And the, and the sonic is is principally the space of noise. I mean, you know, forget the, all the different uh, qualifications are just value judgments. Oh, this is music. And these are words. Like, I mean, in the, in the, in in the world of the sonic, these are value judgments. They're not. They don't have a materiality. They don't have a, a materiality which is distinct. When you look at the waveform, words, music, they all make a shape, <laughs> and the shape isn't different for words. Um, I mean, the form that it takes might be different, but you know, you can't look at it the way and say, "Oh, that's music," or "That's noise." You can't. It's it's all noise, and um, and I'm much more interested in that very forensic way in which uh, noise, sound can work, uh, or I'm much more interested in trying to deploy sound in that very forensic way, so that what it says to us is slightly deeper. It's not about what we think it should be doing. You're trying to access other parts of people's brains using sound in that way.